Am I sharing my screen? Looks like I'm sharing my screen. Oh, I can go for a cup of coffee right now. I don't like that. All right, let's do this. Here we go. All right, so to start off your Earth Science Society Guide for the first semester exam, I thought it would be a great idea to go over why we even name the YouTube channel. Get your mass up. Get your mass up. Remember how to calculate density? Mass divided by volume. Always keep your mass on top. And if you remember, I showed you this density triangle. So how the density triangle works, whatever you're trying to find, you're going to cover up and the formula will be revealed. So let's say that you have a question asking you for density, just cover up density. Now that we've covered up density, we look inside the triangle, we see mass over volume. So the formula for density is mass divided by volume. And this works for all the other formulas as well. Mass will be density times volume and volume will be mass divided by density. And how do we find density? Well, you're going to need a scale and you're going to need a graduated cylinder. The scale is pretty simple. Put the object on the scale and whatever the number says, that's your mass. But when it comes to the graduated cylinder, we have to do a little bit of math. So let's say we start off with eight milliliters of water. That's what we have here on the left. After we add in the rock, we now have 16 milliliters of water, but we haven't added any water. We've just displaced that water. How much did the water go up? Think you figured it out? 16 minus eight. So the water went up by eight milliliters. So the volume of the rock is eight milliliters. Now look at this image. Which liquid would be less dense? The red liquid or the blue liquid? The blue liquid is on bottom. The red liquid is on top. That means the red liquid is less dense. The blue liquid is more dense. What about crust? Can we use density to help us determine differences in crust? Oceanic crust is thin. Continental crust is thick. Oceanic crust, however, is more dense, whereas continental crust is less dense. So when these two collide, oceanic crust is going to be the type of crust that subducts and goes below continental crust. And yes, these guys do meet up, and we call those plate boundaries. Where two tectonic plates interact, faults of volcanoes are often present. We can imagine that this oceanic crust is going to subduct underneath the continental crust, and as it melts and rises up, it will create volcanoes. Now that's not to say that every time two plates meet, they're gonna collide. Sometimes they actually move apart. Here's an example of when two plates move apart. You can see we have a mid-ocean ridge forming as plate one moves away from plate two. The magma is rising up, pushing the plates apart. Anybody remember this guy? Alfred Wegener. He's the guy that came up with continental drift. His theory of continental drift actually helped us develop what we now call plate tectonics. He knew that the continents had to have fit together like a puzzle and that they had moved around in the past. What he didn't know is that convection currents inside the mantle is what was causing all those movements to occur. If we look on this image, we can see the inner core, which is solid, the outer core, which is liquid, and then there's the mantle. With all of that convection going on, we have some mid-ocean ridges forming where plates are moving apart, and we have areas where the plates are moving together. Not only did he think that the plates fit together like a puzzle, but he also found some other evidence. He tested rocks at the Appalachian mountain ranges and the Eastern Greenland mountain ranges and found that those rocks had the same date. He also tested fossils. If you line up where he found these fossils, it connects all of the continents. This was evidence enough for him to say that these continents were definitely connected at one time. I know what you're thinking. Did you just say fossils? Not all fossils are really amazing to look at. Some fossils are just dinosaur tracks like these trace fossils. Some fossils are found buried in the dirt. Here's an example of what happens over time when a dinosaur dies. It takes millions of years for it to turn into a fossil and then for humans to discover those fossils. And if we dig deep, the deeper we dig, the older those fossils become. If we look at this image on the left, you can see that the oldest fossil would be the trilobite. So the deeper we dig, the further back in time. What does that remind you of? Rock layers. The deeper we dig, the older the rock layers become. And we can date these rocks using half-life because when those rocks formed, they had parent isotopes, which were radioactive. And over time, they had to lose those parent isotopes, which turned into daughter isotopes. And after you lose half of your isotopes, that's one half-life. Let's say your half-life was 50 years. It would take another 50 years to lose another half. And we can learn a lot by studying the rock cycle. First of all, we know there's three rock types igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic. And there's many different ways that we can travel through the rock cycle to get to each type of rock. For example, 
to become a metamorphic rock, I need to go through some heat and pressure. If I melt, I'm going to be magma. And after I cool down, then I will be an igneous rock. Speaking of igneous rocks, there's extrusive igneous and intrusive igneous. Extrusive rocks are found on the outside of the earth. Intrusive rocks cool down inside of the earth. And this causes a major difference. Extrusive rocks are going to be fine-grained because they cooled quickly. Whereas intrusive rocks are going to be coarse grain or have big crystals because they cool down slowly. If we look over at the image, we can see the rock on the left, we can barely see any crystals. But the rock on the right has nice big crystals. So the rock on the right obviously cooled slowly in the ground, intrusive. Whereas the rock on the left cooled fast outside the ground, extrusive. Minerals. Rocks are made of minerals. Minerals make up rocks. In order to be a mineral, you have to be solid. You have to be inorganic. You have to be a crystalline structure. And you have to have a specific chemical formula. As long as you can check off all those boxes, you're a mineral. And we test minerals. We do a lot of tests on minerals. One of the tests that we do is the hardness test, which is where we try to scratch mineral. As we look at this chart, we can tell some minerals are very soft, like talc. They actually make baby powder from that mineral, and you can scratch that with your fingernail. Other minerals, like quartz, have a hardness of 7. Those aren't going to be so easy to scratch. Practice reading your Mohs hardness scale so you'll be able to determine what mineral I'm talking about. If I were to say, let's see, if I were to say a mineral can scratch quartz but not corundum, what mineral am I talking about? That would be topaz. Because topaz has a hardness of 8, it can scratch quartz but it cannot scratch corundum. And being that it's earth science, you're gonna need to know how to map the world out. Remember, we have lines of latitude and lines of longitude. The latitude lines are the ones that I like to find first. That determines how far north or how far south you are. Next up would be lines of longitude. These lines tell you how far east or west you are from the prime meridian. You guys should practice reading a map. Go ahead and try to read this one. See that little red dot? How far south is it? How far north is it? How far east is it? How far west is it? We want to start at the equator and work our way down. We're only one line down. Each line is worth 15 degrees. So we have gone 15 degrees to the south. Then we want to work our way to the left. One, two, three lines. That's 15, 30, 45 degrees to the west. So this location would be 15 degrees south, 45 degrees west, and that puts you right there smack dab in South America. Another thing that's going to be on the exam is moon faces. Try to pick out where the full moon is, where the new moon is, and where the quarter moons are. Remember, wherever the sun is at, that's going to determine where the new moon is at. The full moon is always on the opposite side of the sun. And then the moon can cause solar eclipses or lunar eclipses, it all depends on where the moon is. As you can see, during a solar eclipse, the moon is in between the sun and the earth. Whereas during a lunar eclipse, the moon is hiding behind the earth. So the earth is between the sun and the moon. And speaking of the sun, the sun has a life cycle. It all depends on how big the sun starts off as inside a nebula. A nebula is just a big old cloud of dust and gas, and it comes together to form a star. Depending on the mass, we can either have an average sized star or a massive size star. Thanks for watching the video. I hope this helps you on your exam. Have a good one, and I'll see you in the next video. Great job. Bye.